Hello and a very good morning to all of you. My name is Ayush Sanghi and welcome to Baiju's IX. I hope all of you are doing well. Yes. So we are starting with the newspaper for today, the Hindu analysis, 23rd of March, 2024. So what is today's date known for? What is it popular for? If you could just tell me, how is it popular and what is it popular for? Just write in the comment section. So as all of you know that the National Scholarship Test will be held on the 24th of March, that is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Do register and appear for the test to be able to understand your potential, your score and know where to improve. Such kind of mock tests are extremely useful for each one of you in order to test your preparation. Application is highly important and such tests are extremely useful for good type of application. These are the topics that we are going to cover in today's newspaper. The, to the topics are important from the point of view of governance, economy and international relations. When I talk about governance, it is GS paper number two, as well as international relations, again, talks about GS paper number two. How is it important? What all things are important? Let's understand and let's associate with our preparation. Let's have a look at the very first article. It talks about international relations. When I say international relations, this article is a very, very interesting article on again, a new take on the Russia-Ukraine war. I repeat, a new take on the Russia-Ukraine war. When I talk about the Russia-Ukraine war, there are multiple things that all of you need to know, which is the NATO. When we talk about the support given to Ukraine by the NATO countries, which includes the US, which includes most of the countries of the European Union, which is why Ukraine was able to fight Russia for so long. The war has continued for over two years. When I talk about that long duration of war, that long duration of war can only be sustained if you have enough resources, enough aid coming. And this aid was being provided by the NATO countries. This aid was being provided to, to Ukraine by the NATO countries as well as by the US. Now, the point is that support was being given in a dual fashion. When I say dual fashion, one was the aid that was being disbursed, which was in terms of money, plus in terms of arms, military aid. In terms of money, in terms of arms. Followed by that, the second type of aid, what can be included or what can be told, is the sanctions which were imposed on Russia. When I talk about the sanctions, when I specifically talk about the sanctions, what is it that all of us need to know? What is it that all of us need to associate with is something which is highly important. When I talk about sanctions being imposed, they are things which we have to correlate with. So when we talk about the sanctions, how is it that we are associating? What is it that we are associating with is something that is highly important. Sanctions being imposed on the Russian Federation are not importing oil from that country. You are not importing oil. These are called as energy sanctions. As you know, energy or oil is a money spinner for most of the countries, especially the countries which are loaded with oil. These countries are in the Middle East. This country is also one of these countries is Russia. When we talk about oil exports or imports of oil, because it is a necessity, it turns into a money spinner 
because it results into guaranteed trade and guaranteed revenue, which was true when it came to the oil trade between Russia and the European Union, especially the developed economies, the industrialized economies like Germany, France, Hungary, Czech Republic. So all these countries imported good amounts of oil. When they imposed energy sanctions, nobody was importing oil from Russia. But here comes the catch. And the reason why we are discussing the article today is something which is very interesting that all of you should understand. When we are talking about this kind of aid and sanctions, a specific country came into light and the name of that country is Hungary. When I talk about Hungary, you just have to know the location of this country. How far is it from Ukraine? So just have a look at this rough map of European Union that shows Russia. This is Russia. This obviously is Ukraine. And here you can see this is Hungary. Hungary shares a direct border with Ukraine. When I say direct border, the entry into Ukraine and from Ukraine of the refugees is very easy. Now when we talk about Hungary, Hungary being a part of NATO, it's a part of NATO. What is what it should have done, like the other NATO countries, to support Ukraine in its war by providing them aid, which includes financial aid, which also includes military aid, as well as provide a route to Ukraine and from Ukraine, to and from Ukraine. All these things Hungary refused to provide. So the catch is that Hungary refused to provide any kind of aid to the NATO countries, the group which itself is a member of, which means Hungary is a member of that group. It refused to provide that support to NATO countries or NATO as an organization, as an alliance to support Ukraine in their war against Russia. And this came as a surprise. How? Let's understand. Hungary stopped or let's say Hungary vetoed when it came to the aid which was supposed to be provided by the European Union to Ukraine. It vetoed that aid, which means Hungary stopped the money to go from European Union to Ukraine to be able to fight the Russia war. And Hungary also talked about the same to stop the aid that was coming from the US. So Hungary's president Hungary's Prime Minister talking with the US President at that, that time point of time to specifically say that even US should not be aiding Ukraine any further. So just have a look at these facts. You'll be surprised to know the US has provided $75 billion in military and civil aid to Ukraine since February 2022, which is over two years before, most of which has been used for weapons. This is called military aid purchases and humanitarian requirements. An additional $60 billion of assistance or aid has been stopped. This is no longer going to Ukraine. The point is, any kind of war leads to a loss of lives, loss of infrastructure, plus it requires a lot of money to fight that war. If you don't have the money, you can't fight a war. You simply have to give up, you have to lay your arms, and you have to agree to whatever the other party, the wedding party, has to say. It's like giving up or giving a rollover, giving a walkover on the game, or just like in a game of chess. When you know that you are going to be, uh, you are going to face a checkmate, so you don't move forward, you just lie down straight on the ground. The European Union has done the same thing now. It's, it had committed 144 billion euros in aid to Ukraine, but it is not providing the same level of military assistance as the US. It is unlikely that US will send further military aid in 2024 because a lot of money has already been provided. So when I talk about Ukraine, Ukraine has done what? Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, after meeting Donald Trump, stated that Trump has expressed his intention to suspend the military aid to Ukraine and negotiate an end to Russia-Ukraine war. Basically, everyone has made money in a war. It leads to a loss of human lives and rest Corporates, big business houses, governments, members of parliament, all of them, they end up making good amounts of money. And this is precisely what happened. Now, the role of Hungary in this is that Hungary has stopped 
I repeat, Hungary has stopped any kind of aid. Plus, Hungary is not providing its own area since it's a border country. You can see it's a border country, but it is not allowing its border to be used. Border to be used by the European Union countries, by the European Union countries to travel to Ukraine or to send supplies to Ukraine. You cannot send supplies to Ukraine using Hungary's border or Hungary's territory and you cannot supply military aid using the Hungarian territory. This has been the biggest bone of contention between Hungary and the other members of the European Union. So, the, so Hungary has taken a pro-Russia stance. I repeat, Hungary has taken a pro-Russia stance. When I say pro-Russia, what all has it done? Firstly, it has not conceded to all other members of the NATO, of the alliance. Followed by that, what has Hungary done is that Hungary is not speaking against the Russian president, is not speaking against Russia's atrocities in Ukraine. So, this basically tells that Russia's atrocities in Ukraine are not that much or Hungarian Prime Minister chooses to go against it or chooses to speak against it. Now, beyond that, it is also said that Hungary is a close ally of Russia, which is why Russia has found an ally within the NATO, which is providing aid and support to Russia, probably in some other form. So, when we talk about financial aid and sanctions, Hungary has voiced opposition to EU sanctions against Russia, particularly energy-related sanctions, which means Hungary doesn't agree to these sanctions. Hungary is still importing oil from Russia. Hungary held up $18 billion of European Union aid using its veto power. And Orban, who is the Russian Prime Minister, is seen as Russian President Putin, Putin's closest ally in the European Union. He has strolled a careful line in condemning Russia's invasion while steering clear of criticizing the President of Russia. And this is what has happened. This is what has led Hungary to maintain a neutral stance. So you can say that it has maintained a neutrality and neutral stance by not giving in to NATO's request, at the same time not going against the Russian president. This is known as playing smart. I repeat, this is known as playing really smart. So I hope you enjoyed the article and you got the gist of it. This is a newer angle, you can say, where we talk about the Hungarian or let's say one member of the alliance who's going against the alliance in order to support Russia or in order not to support Ukraine, right? Now we talk about GS2 governance, a good article given on page number 6. Now all of you I know have heard a lot, have attended a lot of sessions within this in the last few days about the Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA, Citizenship Amendment Act. So, a brief discussion about Citizenship Amendment Act. Followed by that, we would take a newer angle today to describe or to analyze that what has led the government of India to provide citizenship to those people who, are, who don't belong to this country or who are an origination of this country but stayed in some other country. Now, they have come back to India in whatever sense, but they are being provided citizenship on religious basis. I repeat, they are being provided citizenship on religious basis. When I talk about on the basis of religion, what is that religion factor that has come into play and why the CAA has not included the people from the Muslim community? When we talk about this, we need a little background. So just take that little background, just listen to it and then we will give a certain kind of understanding on why the CAA in India is justified. Right? Citizenship Amendment Act, as all of you know, is a law that provides citizenship, citizenship to people from six religions. People from six religions. What are these six religions? I hope all of you know those religions. Hindu, Buddha, Sikh, Jain, 
Christian, just like that, all six religions or people from these six religions who have entered India as an immigrant before a specific cutoff date, and that cutoff date is 31st of December 2014, they would be granted citizenship of India by the government of India under the Citizenship Act of 1955. I repeat, under the Citizenship Act of 1955, people from six religions who have entered into India from adjoining countries as an immigrant would be given Indian citizenship. So there's a provision, provision number six, that basically gives the criteria for granting citizenship to these people. And the government of India has relaxed those provisions or relaxed that criteria to be able to grant the citizenship to those people. So when we talk about citizenship granting, when we talk about people getting that citizenship, it is highly important for us to briefly know about the Citizenship Amendment Act. Just quick, let's quickly have a look. So when we talk about the Citizenship Amendment Act, what is it that all of us need to know of? That Section 6B, Section 6B of the Citizenship Act of 1955, it states that you have to give the proof of the country of your origin. So people from these six religions will be giving a proof as to their fathers, their mother, their forefathers who belong to India. They have to give a proof of the country of their origin. Along with that, the proof of which religion they belong to because religious parameter or religious criteria is being used. Followed by that, when did they enter India? If they give the proof for these three things, they can, be, they can apply for Indian citizenship and most probably, if everything turns out to be correct, they would be granted Indian citizenship. They would be granted Indian citizenship. When we talk about Indian citizenship in particular, this is basically heavily criticized. Now, what are the concerns and why is the present government or ruling party criticizing or being criticized for making sure that people only from a specific religion are not being granted citizenship via this law? Why are people from one religion not being granted citizenship? This is something which is being talked about. So it goes against the ethos of India, which talks about right to equality. It talks about right to equality. It goes against the ethos of this, of this provision. And because it's a fundamental right, we are a secular nation, one, two. We treat everyone as equal or equals are being treated equally, which is encapsulated in right to equality as a part of Article 14. So when we talk about granting citizenship to people from only religious six religions or it is being categorized on religious basis, you can simply state that this is going against the ethos of Article 14. Followed by that, the Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Register of Citizens, the NRC, that was being formulated four years back. So this entire thing is following or going against the, the entire understanding of proper documentation because the people who are being granted citizenship under this particular provision as a part of this amendment are the people who are illegal immigrants. When we talk about illegal immigrants, how do you know that the documentation is proper or the documentation is foolproof? So it is highly important for us to know the people who are being granted citizenship are actually the people who were exploited and they actually belong to one of these six religions. This is something which is important. So in order to figure that out, what is the proof? What is the right area of documentation that has to provide this kind of an understanding? Because these things are not very clear, which is why CAA was heavily being targeted. And obviously, there is one portion which says that this law or this particular provision is anti-secular. Looking at all these things, the reason which has come from the Home Minister himself is why CAA is justified. Why is the Citizenship Amendment Act justified? Because the first reason is partition. Partition happened or the people who did partition believed in the two-nation theory. 
and that two nation theory was was believed to have been done on one pretext and that pretext was religion so partition was done on what basis it was done on religious grounds hence if you are granting citizenship to people from your own religion or people from a particular religion on the basis of which the religion or on the basis of which the partition was not done you are granting citizenship only to those people who don't belong to that particular religion it is justified so let's take an example so india and pakistan were made and that was primarily done on the basis of what on the basis of two nation theory where it was that area that was given the new status on the basis of the muslim dominated region and same happened with east pakistan muslim dominated region so they were created on the basis of religion hence the people or let's say the people who were non muslims who chose to stay in those countries whether pakistan or afghanistan or bangladesh the present day bangladesh those people were heavily persecuted i repeat they were heavily persecuted especially in pakistan they were heavily persecuted persecution means exploitation persecution means they were asked or forced to convert persecution means they were not given a proper dignity of life so this is the second reason persecution was happening but who was being persecuted it was not the muslims it was it was the non muslims so we are granting citizenship india is granting citizenship to those people who had gone over there as a part of being from one community so people who were not belonging to that community they were persecuted and they are being granted citizenship in india by the government of india so government of india stands at one single place where it states if we are not going to grant citizenship to our own people who somehow chose to stay over there and were persecuted then who will and those people obviously cannot be from the muslim community because the country that was created it was created on the basis of religion where muslims were supposed to stay in that country so look at this the home minister cited reasons the first reason was partition which was done on religious grounds and second is official islamic status of these countries suggesting no persecution against muslims so muslims are not being persecuted over there if muslims are not persecuted over there then who is the non muslims hence if the non muslims are being persecuted over there and some way or somehow they they manage to enter india so they need to be given that right to stay in india and hence the citizenship amendment act comes to their rescue and this is something the reason which has been given for muslim exclusion and the reason which is given in order to justify that whatever has happened has happened for a particular reason and that reason is justified so this is the second article important for gs2 now coming to the third article which is important for gs3 economics it is given on page 11 you'll be happy to know that india's real gdp mind you the term quoted in the newspaper in the article and the headline as you can see over here is india's real gdp it stands at what it may hit 8% this fiscal year when i talk about the fiscal year it is 2023-24 and this is signaled by none other than sitaraman the finance minister so when we are talking about <coughs> in their real gdp growth what exactly do we mean by that let's understand it's this is conceptual when we talk about 2023 24 the financial year india is as it is growing at a very good rate it is growing at the fastest rate it is the fastest growing economy with the estimates being at 7.2% but later increased to revised to 7.3% which was quoted in this budget in the interim budget not just by the indian finance minister but has also been stated by the global uh, agencies like the imf the world bank etc and this basically puts india in a good position to be able to show to the world that even when the other countries are going through a slow down when they are going through a slow down or they are going through a recessionary phase india still manages to grow now the point is that we are growing but that growth is what kind of growth hence we need to understand the measures the measures of national income or let's say the measures of 
growth. The measures of national income or the measures of growth. The most popular measure of national income or the measure of growth is gross domestic product GDP. When I talk about GDP or gross domestic product, it basically measures what? Please listen to the definition of GDP. GDP is what focuses on the word domestic, which basically means a specific geographical area. It means a geographical area, a certain geographical area, which is included as a part in order to determine, in order to justify as to whatever is being done, it is done within this geography. So if you need to uh, understand it via the definition, the definition states that gross domestic product can be defined as the total final value, final value of goods and services produced within a geographical territory, within a geographical territory of a particular country in one financial year or in a specified period. Specified period normally is one financial year. So we take the total final value of the goods and services which are produced within a geographical area in a single territory and that is what we call as the GDP, gross domestic product. Now the point is that if the total final value of goods and services that I sell today, if I take that and I include that and I quote that let's say my national income is 100 rupees. In this particular case, this particular national income that has been calculated today will be termed as nominal GDP. I repeat, it will be termed as nominal GDP. When I say nominal, it basically means prices or GDP at current prices. Current prices, the price which is today. The price which is today, it might be inflated, it might be deflated, it might it, it can be whichever ways it can happen it can go up it can go down so the gdp that we are getting at nominal prices might not be a proper measure to measure growth so if i take nominal gdp at rupees 100 let's say this has increased from last year last year it was 90 and today it is 100 so can i say that my growth is 11 percent this growth is probably is probably not proper growth that has been calculated. It has increased from 90 to 100. Probably this year we have very high inflation. If this year we have very high inflation, then these growth figures are not, not accurate. The growth figures are not accurate. When, so when we talk about the growth figures, when we start to understand the growth figures, when we start to correlate it with the growth figures, the nominal measure of GDP is not a proper measure or let's say it is not an accurate measure. I'm not saying it is wrong. So don't consider it as wrong. Eventually, we do calculate it. But a better measure or a more accurate measure is real GDP. Real GDP or this word real, if the word real is used in economic sense, is basically means that this kind of GDP is adjusted for inflation. I repeat, it is adjusted for inflation. Inflation adjusted GDP normally happens in comparison to a base year. This base year is fixed by the authorities, which is a different calculation, but you fix a base year in order to understand that we have to compare our price vis-a-vis -a, -vis a base year and then we have to quote what our GDP is. So with respect to the base year 2011-12 with the present year 2023-24, what we calculate can be called as inflation adjusted. GDP. I repeat, it is termed as inflation adjusted GDP. This GDP is a more accurate measure because just think that if my income has grown from 100 to 120, so I will quote 20% growth, but out of 20%, 10% is the rate of inflation in my economy, then my real growth is only 10%. It is not 20%. If I take 20% growth, then it will be misleading for me. Similarly, at a country level, it will be all the more misleading because you will make your policies according to that nominal growth rate, which is not correct. This policy, this inflation 
this inflation has contributed to that growth rate and inflation is nothing inflation is if i say that i am teaching i i was teaching all you wonderful students i was teaching 100 students in 2021 in 2024 also i am teaching 100 students only does that mean i have grown i have not grown my fees would have increased from 2021 to 2024 on inflationary basis but my growth has not happened because number of students are the same so this is not growth real growth can be calculated by deducting inflation or adjusting inflation from the growth rate which has been calculated at the nominal level so this is what we calculate and this is what we come to know of this is the growth so the most popular gdp measure as you would know is expenditure method and there are other methods which are used to calculate gdp like income method and the value added method so these things are important for prelims normally a question from national income accounting does appear in prelims this happens in prelims now we talk about another article on international relations page number 12 this again is an interesting article what does it state and how do we look at it so all of you would know about the united nations security council you would know about the members of the united nations all right members of united nations so when we take this into consideration it is normally 5 plus 10 right so five members are called permanent members the other 10 members are non-permanent members and this list of 10 members it keeps on rotating it keeps on rotating i mean it keeps on changing after a certain number of years so you will tell me in the comment section that is india a member in one of these 10 countries as a non-permanent member so please tell this to me so 5 plus 10 15 members in order for any proposal to get into un or any proposal to be discussed in the united nations united nations general assembly you need a majority of these countries to vote in for it a majority of these countries means at least nine members should vote in for it if you want a proposal to be discussed i'm not talking about past past is a different thing i'm talking about a proposal to be discussed and that is something that has to be included as a part of this particular objective of united nations members so once you have that kind of an understanding and you get that acceptance of these votes of these members in order for that proposal to be discussed now the passage of that proposal depends on these five members these five members who are these five members for the security council or who are these five members permanent members also are part of united nations security council who have the power to vote who have the power to basically turn things or turn events in the in their own favor or in the favor of certain issues that are going on around the globe this power is there with these permanent members who are also a part of the security council five members starting from the us united states united kingdom france russia china five countries have these powers the uh, uh, now the problem with this is that these five members have been given the power to veto any issue what do we mean by veto that if there are certain number of members let's say five members in this case if four members are voting in for a particular proposal they are voting in for a particular proposal but the fifth member votes out or decides to vote out decides not to go ahead with the other four members then what will happen in that case what will happen in that case the bill or the proposal has been vetoed and nobody will be will be able to decide on or nobody will be able to do that or implement that particular thing this is the problem with veto power so when we talk about veto power if you look at this entire concept the five permanent members of security council have or they can prevent the adoption of any proposal any resolution by vetoing it and this is precisely what had, what has happened over here in terms of veto so just have a look russia and china vetoed a us led draft resolution at the security council on a ceasefire in gaza 
we are not talking about israel gaza or uh, you can say uh, the hamas war that has happened because that discussion has already taken place by many faculties in the past and it has been going on for the entire week but when a draft resolution came out by the us which actually supports israel it was vetoed by russia and china that actually are possibly supporting hamas which is a terrorist militant organization the us israel's main ally put forward the resolution which for the first time would have suspended the imperative of an immediate and sustained ceasefire and condemned the 7th of october attack by hamas an attack has been happening since then till now so it's it's been like months now so imperative of an immediate and sustained ceasefire Uh, this ceasefire implementation and a draft being proposed and you are vetoing that draft so what does it mean that you don't actually want this particular proposal to be implemented or a ceasefire to happen now the point is that with a ceasefire actually it is more more than stopping the military action it is more about promoting humanitarian aid look it's it's leading to a loss of human lives small kids babies mothers pregnant mothers lactating mothers and innocent civilians eventually in a war who is the person who's at a loss it's not the military it's never the governments it's always the people who suffer and now those people have to be evacuated from there they have to be sent to other countries they will be living their entire life or their kids would be living a life of oblivion and they would be living their life as refugees which is an even undignified way of living your life so why not just put a ceasefire or put an end to it for putting an end is a far fetched dream or at least putting a ceasefire of not going ahead because what is it leading to it's like russia ukraine what has it led to over 2 years of war unnecessary aid hundreds of millions of dollars of aid financial aid military aid loss of lives loss of infrastructure and also contributing to loss of economy of so many countries and for what what has happened nothing has happened eventually from what is he saying he is saying that russia and ukraine should come at a uh, uh, should come on the table and talk what they should have talked two years back i mean you don't have the uh, 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 have the prowess to actually counter russia ukraine is a small country and now when the aid stops eventually zelensky has to come back to sitting on the table and make sure that whatever they are agreeing upon and that agreement has to come into place that is something that has to happen so any kind of war can only stop on the basis of a proper understanding and a proper conversation where a narrative has to be developed and that conversation would lead to probably solving the solution or may might come out a solution to solving a problem russia and china exercised their vetoes algeria also voted against and guyana abstained you don't have to remember this data this is just for knowledge other 11 members voted in favor including permanent members france and britain as well as the us so five permanent members three voted and two vetoed even if one vetoes then also you cannot go ahead with it so the point is that you are <clears throat> you are not going ahead with this kind of an understanding but it is actually not leading to anything it is not leading to putting a ceasefire or putting an end to an war so that's the problem now one more trivia i would like you to know and that is that this veto power or negative or incorrect use of veto power is basically not allowing the the security council of permanent members to function well or to give pass certain resolutions in the council so there is a proposal to change the veto power or there is a proposal of to change the veto to majority that now even if there are three members agreeing to a proposal and two are not agreeing like in this case china and russia are not agreeing because the majority members have agreed still we'll go ahead with it so this is something that can be implemented this is something that can happen so this attempt at reform was proposed but again you very well know even for the reform to pass you would need the approval of all five members and the five members would not approve they would veto even this provision which is to change the veto so that's something funny that can happen or that might happen in this particular case so this is there these were the important articles in today's newspapers two articles from international relations one article on governance one article on economy these are the main questions that you should be solving analyze the impact of the russia ukraine conflict on the existing war world order 
discuss the role of major global powers in this conflict and the implications for international relations. Substantiate your answer with relevant examples. So Russia-Ukraine conflict, the impact of this war on the existing world order, the world order, the world has been split. Now it's a bipolar world. People are calling it a multipolar world, which is also correct. Some people, like for example, within NATO, a country is supporting Russia and the rest of the NATO alliance is supporting Ukraine. So role of major global powers like the US, like the UK, like China, like India in this conflict and the implications for international relations. How would this change the world order? Again, because there are two countries fighting and all the entire world has taken sides. So it turns into a bipolar world. This is not a cold war. This is an active war which has been happening. And the same thing has been happening at a smaller scale between Israel and Hamas. So you can write the answer. This is an interesting question. 150 words. Examine the role of GDP as a measure of economic progress. GDP is... So there's a very, very good question that was specifically stated and certain students asked me in the class. Gross domestic product, is it a good measure or is it a better measure than the other measures? Other measures are gross national product, net domestic product, net national product, which is a better measure. So role of GDP as a measure of economic progress, discuss its limitations and the impact of GDP growth on socio-economic development, highly important. The impact of GDP growth on socio-economic, samajik or arthik taur pe, uska kya development pe impact hota hai, ye aapko batana hai. So what are its limitations? Limitations, we take domestic, we don't take national. I provide examples from both developed and developing countries. You can take examples of developed countries like the US, which considers GNP as their measure. You can take the examples of developed countries like Germany and developing countries like China and India. Why do we refer to GDP and not GNP? GDP is more in case of, especially in case of India, uh, GDP is more in case of India and GNP is more in case of the US. This is what you should be remembering. After this, certain news items with respect to prelims. So this is something which is very basic, certain names. It might just appear, so you need to know. So our Prime Minister was awarded Bhutan's highest honour, the Order of Ruk Gyalpo. Why? Because of India's support to Bhutan in the fight of COVID-19 in terms of vaccination. Suraksha Kavach. So looking at this, Bhutan was provided and many other countries were and we, they needed us in that particular time and India provided that kind of support, which is why the Prime Minister was awarded the highest honour. Bhutan's king, his name is Jigme Khesar Namgyal Rangchuk. So he was on a tour to India a couple of years back, a very popular picture of his baby playing with our Prime Minister. It went viral. Followed by that, Filipino, Philippines vessels in South China Sea. Chinese Coast Guard is notorious for the activities that the Chinese Coast Guard vessels, the Chinese Navy conducts in the South China Sea. Just to show you a context, look at this, uh, look at this picture. This is South China Sea. And South China dispute has been going on for decades now. The claim of China on the South China Sea is this 9-9. So it has taken out, it has dug out some kind of old document which created this dash, nine dashes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it claims that this nine dash nine, according to this line, the entire region of South China Sea comes under the jurisdiction of PRC, People's Republic of China, which basically means that the resources which are embedded in the sea, they belong to China and the resources are worth over a trillion dollars. So that's the fight is of resources. The fight is not of the sea. Nobody loves the sea so much. The problem is that sea has resources. Followed by that, the sea is a navigable waterway. It's a navigable waterway. When you have to enter the Pacific or through the Pacific, you have to come to the Indian Ocean over here. The only route is via South China Sea. So if you have to go from Indian Ocean to Pacific Ocean, it happens via the Malacca Strait, south of Singapore. And then you enter the South China Sea and from South China Sea to the East China Sea and finally into the Pacific and vice versa. From the Pacific to the South China Sea and coming down Malacca Strait to the Indian Ocean. Hundreds of trillions of dollars of trade is done on an annual basis and most of the countries trade, especially Africa, Middle East, Asia and the US, South America included. The entire trade is conducted via this route. And South China Sea happens to be right in the middle of it. 
where China is trying to put a claim, which actually poses a problem for all the countries who are actually trading. So these countries and the people who are supporting this cause, they are termed as economic hitmen because of the trade, because of the strategic location, because of its geographical resources. Eventually, everything is resources and money that creates the difference. So Filipino vessels in South China Sea, this is one of the example. And one more thing, the fight is amidst the countries that put a claim on South China Sea, rightly so, via the clauses of UN clause, United Nations Convention on Law of Seas. According to that, what all countries can lay a claim can be there are a part of UN clause. Simon Harris, said to be Ireland's youngest PM, we discussed an article last weekend about Ireland and India-Ireland relationship, how Dublin and New Delhi were close and are still close. AUKUS, trilateral military exercise, this is something that can be asked in the examination. AUKUS means A for Australia, UK, United Kingdom and US, A-U-K-U-S, AUKUS, a trilateral security partnership. A security partnership of multiple dimensions with respect to national security, with respect to armed forces. So the exercise is happening for the Indo-Pacific region between Australia, UK and the US. I mean, this could have happened in the Atlantic as well, but it's happening for to protect or in the Indo-Pacific region, which includes Indian Ocean, as I just told you, it includes Indian Ocean as well as the Pacific Ocean. So these are the things which with respect to <clears throat> with respect to today's newspaper. So I hope you enjoyed the session. You can write the answers to this question, to the questions that I have given. See you in the next class, everyone. And do not forget to attempt the National Scholarship Test, which is happening, due to happen tomorrow at 11 a.m. That would be all. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.